Five, four, three, two, one. Hello, hi, and welcome to the Afro Mavericks. My name is Mop Asik Amura, and this is Mighty Jamie. Hello, everyone. Uh, we've got our uh, protective gear on. This is courtesy oh, of Mighty Jamie. Where's the mask? Here? Where's the mask? Where's the we can't, mask? We can't use the mask. The mask. <laughs> you know, unfortunately, just to be audible, we can't be uh, covered all the way. So we hope that you guys are practicing the social distancing, isolate daily but show. But it's like, the, is that one meter or two? You know what, it, it, it's what we can do for the show. We, we're taking all the other precautions. We try. Okay, so the discussion today is, is there a direct correlation between the quality of education or education as a whole of leaders and good governance? What do you think? So I think it's, it's an interesting question because you you hear this narrative mm. you know sometimes um there's two kinds of narratives that dominate african discourse when we're talking about politics these days yeah. number one if only we could have better educated leaders and number two is this idea that we need young people yeah so i think for now we go, we're going to look at this education question yeah. and we've got a, a, a bunch of presidents here uh, and 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 one other person who's not a president but has a critical position and we're trying we're trying to examine whether or not actually having a well educated guy will lead to the outcomes that people say it will because you know you, you hear this sometimes even from locally the EFF will say things like we need educated people yeah. in parliament we and can't have Emma Bena. themselves rapidly yes they have yes yes they have and what's the underlying premise of all of that is mm -hmm. that if I'm educated then you're going to get the good stuff. Yeah. You're going to get delivery. You're going to get all of the stuff. So yeah. who are we looking at? Okay, so we're going to look at a few precedents on the yeah. African continent. Uh, first, let's look at Bungu Wa Motariga. Yeah, okay. but let's, let's, let's yes, dive let's, in. Let's, let's dive go in. back to it. So, so let's go into Bingu. Yes. What, what is so Bingo, his profession was yeah. actually, he was an economist, right? Okay, economist. Um, he passed away. He had a, a, a bachelor degree in economics. So he was the president of Malawi, right? Yes, president, From former president of 2004 Malawi. 2004 to 2012. Yes. So he got himself a bachelor's degree in economics, which he got uh, in Delhi. His education, most of it was actually in India, yeah. right? He then later ob obtained a PhD again in the development economics of Pacific Western University. That's an American one, right? Yes, that's so BA, he, sorry. BA in economics. Uh, bachelor's in economics yes. in India. A master's, master's in economics, economics in India. And a PhD, PhD in the US. In the US. Exactly. And then he also did like a bunch of short courses, right? Exactly. Like in business management, financial um, analysis, trade, trade promotion, promotions. political leadership, regional economic cooperation, and human resources. Exactly. That's pretty impressive. Then enters the brother, Peter Motariga. Yeah. He is actually a law professor mm -hmm. or was a law professor. Uh, he was trained uh, in international economic law, international law, and comparative law, oh, and constitutional law. Yeah. So he's got quite the rep sheet. Yeah, exactly. uh, he got himself an LLB at the University of London, All right. LLM, and PhD at Yale. So, so, I mean, when I look at this data around the education of these particular men, I then think, wow. Quite extensive. This must mean that Malawi is flying in high colors. Think about that. You got a, a constitutional lawyer, mm. you got a, an economist with a PhD. Mm. You got basically you got two professors here. Exactly. Right? You got professor number one and professor number two. Mm. But when you dig deeper, you don't actually see that, do you, with, with, with Malawi? You don't see, although I mean there is some caveats, yeah. at a very high level, Malawi is on the bottom end of the stick. 70% uh, of their people are still working in the agricultural sector. You've got a very low um, GDP per capita right now of 1,200 US dollars. And that sometimes is misleading because it's not the mean, yeah. it's the average. And there's a difference between a mean and the average. The mean is what affects the most people. The average is what whatever you get when you add up everybody Literally and you divide by numbers, and this factor of so the inequality, inequality exactly. exactly it doesn't actually reflect what the numbers is because on the ground the poorest of the poorest people actually get way less exactly than, than the one thousand two, and this is per year. Mm -hmm. So one thousand two hundred is about twenty thousand rands per year. Mm -hmm. So what we're saying is that the average income, the GDP per capita of every individual in that country is 
what is that? It's like less than, um, what is it? I'm trying to do now, 20,000 divided by 12. Are we doing quick right? maths? It's, it's, um, it's in the one, 1,000 something. Yeah. You can actually, let, you can actually let's, work let's, it out. Let's, let's work that out. Let's work let's it out. We, let's, let's, take, let's take a moment, work it out. 20,000 uh -huh. divided by 12. Yeah. That's 1.6. 1.6, 1,600 rands, give or takes. That's that's not a great not uh, income per capita. So when you're looking at the at the education, you don't actually get a translation into you know. Yeah. But one thing is critical to note about the Malawian leadership. Yeah. When Mutharika Bingu came in, Bingu Mutharika yeah. came in, the GDP was actually three point. 3.47 billion yeah and when he left it was 6.2 billion or when he passed away yeah so there was actually almost Growth. a doubling yeah. of the gdp the, the the so i mean even though the story the high level story is that this was not a massive impact there was still some progress made under him the inflation was very stable at about 7.8 percent but under his brother even though the gdp per capita grew the inflation was all over the place. At some point, it was 20-something percent, and then it's now come down to 11.5. So it's clear that there are some discrepancies, even in performance, when it comes to these leaders. But let's move on. Let's yeah, move on let's to move on. other let's leaders. To, to Zimbabwe, right? To Zimbabwe. I've okay, often heard yeah. that uh, uh, former President Robert Mugabe was the most educated statesman yeah. there ever was in the world, right? So how many so, do we have? Quite a lot. Okay, he got a bachelor's of he got a BA yeah. uh, in history and English and literature from Fort Hare. Makes sense. The right? man was good at English. Uh, he, <laughs> was, he was good at English. He was. He, was. he, also he, that was, he had his joint of land. Yes, not, he, not English. The Queen's English. The yes, Queen. Yes, it was the, the accent. English. It was the accent. He had a, not just no one. He had a proclivity yeah. of mastery in vocabulary. Yes. He had a an affluence yes. in eloquence. Yeah. Uh, but, <laughs> You see what I'm like? Yeah, Apple is the elephant. You know what I'm doing. I'm, I'm telling you that. Like. <laughs> Don't do that. Don't yeah. do it. Okay. So he also got a, a Bachelor of Education yeah. right? uh, through correspondence. He yeah, got it from, from UNISA. UNISA. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, that's that's that's, that's your situation right there. <laughs> that is you know my situation. So you're you're learning where Mugabe went. Oh, all right, all right. Following in those footsteps. For she's for she's right. He got a uh, bachelor of administration from the University of London mm -hmm. through correspondence. You know, yeah. actually, yeah. Because there, really, there was a prison situation mm -hmm. right there, right? Mm -hmm. So the, some of the degrees he got them whilst he was incarcerated. Mm -hmm. So he had a similar situation to Mandela, where at some point mm -hmm. he was incarcerated, not as long as twenty seven years, but I think he was in jail for like 10 plus yes, years yes, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. yeah so, so the university of london was it before or after he came from ghana uh, so i think he went to ghana a little bit later when he had gotten some of these degrees oh, okay because okay, okay, okay. yeah. remember ghana got their independence in was it uh, 57 in the 50s, yes. yeah so it was 57 first independent country uh, if i'm not mistaken and then like mugabe went there a little bit after okay. to, to be part teach. of that whole journey okay. yeah Yes, and that's where he got his uh, African nationalism and exactly, and also his ideas. first wife, yeah, uh, Sally okay. was from. The... So he got a bachelor of science in yeah. economics from again the University yeah. of London. He got a master's in economics, yeah, and then he got the LLB. And like... Bradley had two LLBs, yeah. right? So, so now if we're looking at Mugabe, mm -hmm. right, you got one of the most educated, if not the most educated leader. What do you, what do you interpret? the quality of education to the quality of leadership yeah. or the impact on the country on a Mugabe perspective? Look, I think it was quite interesting. One of the questions that I've always had, um, especially pertaining to the EFF, was, and I actually got the opportunity to ask this question yeah. to the CIC, was that if um, the, what would be the economic policies that are implemented, right, during the ruling party that is the oh and Ghana, you were you, she was there at the business uh, <laughs> situation. Shout out, shout out the business, uh, business, business summit. Black business summit. Black business summit. Yeah. Yeah. Black business yeah. summit. You were the moderator out yeah. there. Yeah. Shout out, shout out, shout out. You asked him. Asking the question. This is I'm not like head. theoretical, no, hypothetical. No, 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 no. This is a high quality show, guys. You got people who had opportunities to ask you this at close range. Yes, at close range. At close range. Yes, I did ask him the question that what would be the economic policies that the EFF would implement if they were under sanctions mm -hmm. of the US or any other yeah. country? He didn't answer that question, okay? Yeah. But however, he did give some context to 
to what he disagrees with in terms of how the land was taken in Zimbabwe, etc. So in terms of my, my question was coming from the 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 perspective of Cuba, Iran, etc., mm. and how they've been able to not necessarily thrive but survive, even though they were under sanctions. Mm -hmm. And it seems that economically, in terms of Zimbabwe, Mugabe was not able to do that, even with his education. Yeah. During the first 10 years of his administration, skyrocketed GDP yeah. grew over 10%, right? But as time went by and with the sanctions, he was unable to implement um, economic policies that were reflective to his own education. So the education... in Yes. And that's one element, you know. So I, I think w without going into a lengthy debate on Mugabe, I think for me the other issue is that the education did not seem to affect the other elements of being a democratic statement, yeah. right? So uh, freedoms, there were very few freedoms under Robert Mugabe. So even though he had two LLBs, education degree, etc. In fact, I would say that his education degree and his teaching experience was probably his greatest asset and contribution to the Zimbabwean story. Everything else, I think he messed up in a big way, even including the economic trajectory. So, but I think when you look at freedoms, you find that the freedoms in Zimbabwe were, were decimated under Mugabe. Yeah. When you look at uh, the, the constitutional structure of the country, there was no real constitutional structure. They made it a one-party state. There was very little accountability. So when you look at the other elements, I don't think that Mugabe, in, 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 in a nutshell, was a net positive for Zimbabwe. When you look at the full body of work, you know, if you look at him in chapters, mm -hmm. you can come out with like, season one was good, or season two was eh. Ah. But when you look at the whole legacy of Mugabe, I don't think that you come up with a net positive. Yeah. So the most educated leader in Africa didn't lead to the most yeah. prosperous But also he country. was crippled by outside factors. I mean, the collapse of the so land... So not affected the men. But, yes. but I think he did <clears throat> contribute to one of the most educated people. Mm. So maybe that's where you place a well-educated leader. You Is don't necessarily put them in charge of everything. Yeah. But because I think what Mugabe displayed was an understanding of education, mm. evaluation of, and, and in fact, it did increase um, the you literacy. Know, literacy rates, the number of, of, of high schools and primary schools, yeah. especially in that 1980 to, to, to 1990 period. He created the foundation. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, just to give you background, um, in Lesotho, mm. most teachers in high school were from Zimbabwe. Yeah. Like most of them. Yeah. Uh, because there was this thing at uh, Zimbabweans, you knew them one, they were extremely educated, extremely well exposed in terms of African, the diaspora, not yeah. South Africa. And most of them were Zimbabwe. You know what I mean? And it's an interesting side to it. And I think it's what Jamie yeah. was, was alluding to in yeah. terms of the teacher, the teacher element really. The, he, he would have been yeah. a great minister of education, education yeah. but I don't think he should have been extended. <laughs> like, the minister of education. No, but I mean, if you think about it, a minister of education can have unlimited terms in office. You can basically be a dictator in a productive way. But when you extend, you know, there are certain things that you can tell students and teachers. We don't tolerate this in schools. We don't tolerate that. We don't tolerate this pushing for excellence. That for me would have been a great fit for Mugabe. Okay. But his ambition and his achievements and in greed. terms of power, yeah. he achieved more power than I think was good for him. And I'm trying to be generous to him. But I think that they messed up a lot, even before sanctions, you know? They messed up. Okay, let's yeah. look at a current... This person is not or was not a president. Yeah. Ntuli Nubi. Uh, yeah. The Nube. Minister of Finance. Nubi. Sorry! Ntuli Nubi. Nubi. Nubi, right? The current Minister of Finance yes. of Zimbabwe. Yes, he's a private education. Uh, okay, so, so let me run through his... Okay. Let me run through his CV. It's, yeah. So... This is... I'll say this. I'm mostly impressed by his experience and education. He's the most, the most impressive, impressive right, on paper, right? right? For sure. Yeah. So, so here's, here's Ntuli Nube, current Minister of uh, Finance in Zimbabwe from 2018 until now. Number one, he was an investment banker. Yeah. And he founded two banks. Uh, number one was Barbican Holdings and another one was Selwyn Capital. So that's where his story starts. He founds these banks. Uh, I'm just going to, I'm going to do his education second. I'm going through his career now. And then aside from that, he was also the asset allocation strategy and manager of the global managed fund at Investec. Hmm. So you, you you got a guy here who's coming through with all of the hits. Oh, you know, oh, oh, oh. starts two banks, 
goes and is an asset manager at Investec, he wasn't playing around. Yeah. He was the chief economist and vice president of the African Development Bank. Mm. That's nothing to play with. He was also the dean of the Witz Commerce Law and Management Faculty. But not only that, he was a lecturer in finance at the London School of Economics. He was a professor of public policy at the Blavatnik School of Government at the University of Oxford. Yeah. This man is ticking all the box. He is. This uh, London School of Economics, Oxford. He's, he's got Investec in his CV. Yeah. His education background, Bachelor of Science in Economics, Bachelor of Science Honours, Master of Philosophy, uh, Mathematical Finance, PhD in Mathematical Finance from Cambridge. Yeah. Sounds like the most perfect candidate. This is the guy, right? On not, paper. Not just the Minister of Finance, but an entire president. Just, this is the guy. This is the guy. The, who this, if you're looking on paper and yeah. juggling no, and you're you doing see, a draft. Is, this is the one. This is who you want to draft. But, but, yeah. Let's talk about it. In practice, it's not reflecting. It's, 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 it's a disaster. Right thing, okay? It's a disaster. 500% plus of inflation. inflation this year. I mean, last year they had to suspend it. Yeah. Remember, it got to 250 something, and then he was like, that's it, we're not measuring inflation. Who suspends inflation? Because he was trying to manage the numbers. He was like, I can't, I can't massage these numbers if you keep bringing them out. So let's stop. And in fact, this 500% inflation mm. may even be higher. Yeah. This is just what they're willing to admit. Remember last year, he also made a few own goals, if you will, because one of the things that a, a currency needs is you need confidence in a currency. You need people to trust the money and to trust the people behind the money. So this guy, when Zim was in a multi-currency basket, but using the US dollar, the rand, whatever, well, things were stable. Use the rand, but yeah, things were stable, and that's what the opposition does want. Yeah. Um, things were stable. Then the guy was asked, "Are you going to introduce a new currency?" He says, "No, we're not going to introduce a new currency." Then a few months later, boom, new currency. What does that say to the market? You're not reliable. You're not somebody that they can depend on. When you speak, they can't depend on your word. And that defeats the whole launch of a new currency because the yeah. confidence is gone. Now, if you had a guy with a PhD in all of the things that he has, a guy who has been lecturing at the School of Economics at Oxford, etc., why would you do that kind of an own goal? Yeah. You, so for me, there's a definite gap. Even when you look at the GDP per capita in Zimbabwe right now, it's $2,147. Mm. When you compare that with the GDP of South Africa, the GDP of South Africa right now is 13600 mm. So that's almost what? Um, a difference of 10000 US dollars. So if we do the maths, two, two, math? that's basically 2000 times, uh, let's say, times 20, 40,000, you divide that by 12, you, you're you basically sitting on what? Um, about 4,000 rands per month mm. on average for the whole country. But remember, there's a, a discrepancy in income ratios there. So most of the people are not going to be earning anywhere close to that, right? <clears throat> and we know in reality, most Zimbabweans are ma making less than 1,000 rands yeah. as things stand right now. So this guy comes in 2018. He's had a significant amount of time. But it doesn't look like the education matches with the with 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 the uh, with with the leadership. Mm. In fact, there's like a gap. There's a massive gap. So that makes me start to wonder: Does the education really count? Who 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 are the good performers? Well, well educated. Yeah. Who would you say from the list that we've looked at? There's one that I know you don't want to mention, but we gotta mention him. Tabo Mbeki. Tabo Mbeki. Tabo Mbeki is so, that guy. Okay? Let's go through what, he, what yeah. is his education. So, Tabo Mbeki is, <laughs> right, he, he, he's an economist, right? Yes. Essentially, he never actually practiced as one prior yeah, to him because of the becoming activism, the president yeah. of South Africa. He was an activist, right? He did get um, a degree in economics from the University of London. He got a master's again in economics and development from the, the University of Sussex. So, how did he perform as as uh, an economic leader because I think with him yeah. it's good to measure him on economics because that's what he went to school for mm. so let's see how did he do economically he he was able to grow his GDP yeah. uh, pretty good but look can I just say this before say, we get into say. it my biggest beef is with President Tabombeki 
is the ESCOM situation. 1998, white paper comes out, hello, this capacity will not be able to... So he was not proactive in yes. that respect. So in terms of tackling that, he was not able to... I think I think that's fair. That was a collective yeah. ANC problem, though, because they kept bringing that information back mm -hmm. to everyone. Mm -hmm. And Jacob Zuma also, you know, kicked the ball down the road. Mm -hmm. And then he bet on this nuclear thing, didn't happen, Gupta's, whatever. You want to say something, Mr. Producer? I want to I wanna, I wanna know. Um... Mbeki, under Mbeki's term, mm. a lot of what we call the black diamond assumed. Mm. The black middle class, a lot of people went to university, a lot yeah. of black people had more opportunities in terms of corporate and, and um, private sector in terms of Manco, Exco, and all, 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 all that type of trajectory. Um, would you not say, on aggregate, he did far much more better than his Mugabe predecessor? No, look, Tabo Mbeki grew the economy. Like, if you're looking at uh, GDP per capita, it moves from 2.9 thousand to 6 thousand, basically rounding up in his tenure. From that's from 2000 to uh, the year 2007. So if you look at that, that's impressive. He basically he doubled, he doubled the GDP per capita for for South Africans. The GDP itself grew tremendously under Thabo Mbeki. Unemployment went from 25.4 to 22.7. So he reduced unemployment. Inflation was stable throughout uh, the time that Tabu And our national debt. No, national debt, national was, debt was, 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 relatively was relatively low. low. So all of those metrics are the kind of metrics that an economist would care about. If you were to come in and say to an economist, how are you doing? What are the measures? Say, look, the GDP is growing. The growth of GDP is good. And it was good. Uh, economy was growing in some of the years over 5%. Uh, in unemployment is on the low. Inflation is stable. The currency is trading at a stable rate to the US dollar. All of the metrics that you would measure an economist on, he'd tick the boxes. If you move beyond that, right, into the other metrics, like the ESCO metrics that you've rate, that's one. If you look at the HIV, HIV crisis, yeah. that's another yeah. one. HIV. So it does look like there are limits <clears throat> to what, you know, being well-educated in one thing yeah. can but, have. But I'll also say this. We know that a country in, in its first 10 years, straight after independence or liberation, performs really well economically. Depends, because but, Mozambique didn't do yes, that, right? But so most, most countries, especially African countries, you look at Ghana, you look at um, Zimbabwe, you look at South Africa, and the first five years of Tabombeke's reign was within that yeah, but the second wasn't right. So yeah. I think I think you 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 gotta give him credit where credit is due. Mandela put all of the systems in place for Tabo to perform well, yeah. and he was able to build on those gains. You know, so some of those things are you know it's an early um, democracy, one that didn't fall into the ground because mm. some of them fell straight into the ground. You know, like you're looking at DRC, look at several other places. Several others didn't. You're right. But I think that we have to give him credit where credit is due. And he was able to execute a ne neoliberal economic policy, which is what he would have been educated on yeah. at the University of Success. He, su su Sussex. Sussex. <laughs> Sussex. 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 Also, like, it got a bit weird when he was trying to run for a third term as the ANC president. Well, I mean, there were concerns about Zuma and stuff. So, yeah. I mean, broadly speaking, right, I think... We can give him um, a tick, a tick for somebody who was well educated, who ran things well. And economically, he, he did he fail in other spaces. I find that he also failed in his Pan African mm -hmm. uh, negotiation, because Tabo spent Especially some for time. Renaissance Tabo yes, yeah. he spent some time in Zimbabwe in the early eighties with Nangago, with Mugabe, and his relationship with those gentlemen was personal. And he was unable to divorce his personal relationship with them yeah. to negotiate the kind of reforms that were necessary um, to really uh, put Zimbabwe on a new page. But Mavericks, aren't we also just... So as you guys are talking, here's what I'm thinking. Yeah. There's where education starts and stops. And, mm -hmm. there's where, and, then, and then there's a element where politics starts. Yeah. And the politics is a little bit different from academics. Academia... Theoretical, I need to understand, I need to analyze society in a particular way, its actors and whatever. But politics is the balance of all those contradictions within society. Yeah. All the different factions, all the different interests, and trying to... But that's, that's what we're measuring, right? We're measuring whether or not having an educated leader does help 
in the next outcome. Which, because okay. this, what, this is what some of the politicians are saying yeah. um, works. But we, which guy do you want to discuss now? It should bring us to the next guy, who is Muammar Gaddafi. Okay, and the brother leader yes, and the guy brother of the leader. revolution. So, which is very interesting, like the, the sovereign leader yes. of Libya, right? Gaddafi was <laughs> interesting, because there was a president... <laughs> There was the prime minister, yes, and then there was but him. But he was the brotherly leader. He's like the, the brotherly the leader, and the guy. He's like the Ayatollah. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the guy supreme, from the, the revolution. Yes. <laughs> so not much. Yeah. 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 From 1977 to 2011, when they brutally yeah. killed him on the streets. Exactly. Yeah. So no actual education. He got military yeah. training. He did his secondary yeah. schooling. So he, wait, yeah. wait. Gaddafi briefly went to the University of yeah. Libya in Benghazi. He dropped briefly. out. Briefly. He dropped out. So he was the varsity dropout. Out, that guy. And then he went to the Royal Military yeah. Academy and there he completed military mm. training. So if you look at Gaddafi, mm. what's your what's your what's your next summation of his time? It's very interesting. I mean, uh, the capita per income mm -hmm. um, during his reign was around 11,000 to 12,000 mm. US dollars. Making it currently, yeah. yes, currently it's a good 9,000. Yeah. So to show that he, he performed quite well. But it's very and they interesting. Were top of, they were in the top five of the yes. African countries. Yeah. What's interesting is the unemployment rate is that... Yeah. The highest it's been in Libya, right, was under Gaddafi's time, which the, 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 I'm like uh, struggling to reconcile. And this is data from the World Bank is yeah. that the highest was a good 21%. This is during Gaddafi's time. Yeah. The highest post Gaddafi has been 19.5%. Well, and I think you got to measure the, the, the un unemployment data now mm. with the caveat because there's a war going on. Yeah. There's two regions. So the data may not be as accurate as, as people possible. want it to be because sometimes. Even if you look at the Zimbabwean unemployment data, mm. they can even project unemployment data as low as 11%, mm. saying that Zimbabwe has a low, lower unemployment rate than South Africa. And that's inconceivable. And on the other side, you've got people saying that the unemployment data is 90%. So it's, it's a range. But I think when you look at Libya, mm. most people would agree that quality of life was better under Gaddafi than it is in the current dispensation. Healthcare. People were going to study overseas with support exactly. from the state. You got 11,000 GDP per capita. That's good. There was a lot of um, support for civilians. People were generally of the view that Muammar Gaddafi was, a, was better for the economy of Libya mm. than the post-Gaddafi era. Most interestingly is that Gaddafi was also one of the critical leaders to bring together what we now call OPEC, this oil uh, oil consortium of this uh, yes, Arabian countries. there's a little countries. bit of drama with that right now. But yeah. yeah, so he was the guy who said, listen, why are we taking prizes from the West when the oil is coming from here? Yeah. We should come together, we will determine the price of oil, and they will negotiate with us, but we must not be price takers. That's one of the things that made him a little bit unpopular in the West because he upended the market of for oil yeah. and then brought the control into the OPEC bloc as opposed to before when they were what were, what we call price takers. So you've got a guy with a Royal Military Academy training yeah. doing far better than most of the other guys with PhDs and all of this from Western institutions. Yeah. So that's one example. Is there another example that we want to look Sankara, at? But I, I just want to add on yeah. with Mama Gaddafi and say that, look, I, it, it boils down also to ideology. He yeah. was also the guy who spoke about, you know, African nationalism and socialism. Yeah. And African so he had an African one, impact. Yes, having one currency, being one country. Yeah. And that's why he was not popular as well. So his passion for Africa and actually his common sense that these are the things that should work as in everyone should be able to have education. It's, it's, it's a human right. It's a basic human right. Everyone should have health care, right? These are the things that show that that actually common sense can be more important than any form of education you can acquire from sure. any uh, top five university. I got you. World, so whatever. let's move. Let's move yes. to Sankara. Sankara is also another guy. Yeah. He got his training or education. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can't see. You can't see. <laughs> but but he is gone. Sankara. Is, it's like this black <laughs> one. This black fish yes. right here. That, there you go, Amanda. Yes, Amanda. Sankara. Imagine All the EFM <laughs> people are going wild right now. <laughs> Sankara! Sankara! Wait! Somebody, no, come on. Yeah, he is that guy. So he also, he's another example of a president who did pretty amazing, cared about his people, yeah. actually deprived himself of a lot of things. He yeah. was a minimalist, this yeah. guy. A minimalist, right? Um, he didn't get... 
the kind of education like yeah. the most most of these presidents yeah. he again got what military training so he got some so military training some, yeah he, he did some study of agriculture whilst he was doing the military training but broadly speaking sankara and gaddafi are not in the realm mm -hmm. of education as Mtulimuwe, Mugabe, Tabumbegi. But for some, the argument can be made that they were better leaders yes. than those particular people. I mean, leaders. literally, on paper, Mama Gaddafi performed better than any of these presidents. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that case could be made. So, what do we conclude about um, education and political leadership? Does it matter as much as people seem to assert now? Looking at, look, these examples are limited. We've only been looking at Africa. We haven't looked at other parts of the world where maybe the, the data would be different. Yeah. But looking at these examples, we've looked at uh, Bingu, both of the, uh, sorry, the Mutharikas, Bingu, Peter, Robert Mugabe. We looked at Watara, but we didn't discuss him. And Ngube, Ngube. Tuli Ngube, one of the highest educated people yeah. on the continent. So, what do you think at the end of it all? I think essentially, look, it, it is justified that people would say, look, we need education because knowledge is potential power. Yeah. The issue is in the implementation of that power. And I think for some of these people, like uh, former President Robert Mugabe, yeah. it was the implementation that lacked. Yeah. And that's where they fell short. And yeah. the sanctions, the collapse of the Lancaster Agreement, yeah. all these other things. But I think at the core of every single presidency is the passion, the courage, and the common sense to lead your people. If you look at Sankara and Gaddafi, they had passion to actually make not just their countries better, better but Africa as a whole better. And that's what drove them. And they were crazy and obsessed with implementing their ideas yeah. and their ideologies, and they were willing to die, to die for them and eventually they both did. They literally died for their ideologies. Yeah. So, so I think that is, I mean, Tawumbek is not a man who's very big on ideology. Although I mean, not, he, is, he is big he's, on Pan-Africanism. I mean, he's, he's, I'm an African. No, but he, he also had Nipad. He, also, he had like, Nipad was a, a, a Pan-African economic policy. He was looking at uh, illicit outflows of cash throughout Africa. Yeah. He has been trying to negotiate some peace deals. I know that sometimes we downplay him, uh, but but to I be fair to African. him, he did he did more than just cite a poem. Yeah. Um, let me let me let me let me give my thoughts on this. Just having thought about it for a bit, is I think that one when we're looking at African leaders, we've got a I, I do think there's a need to look at their education background because some people if they don't have the fundamentals, they can take you backwards. They can misappreciate urgency. They can misappreciate moments like what we see with Trump and this COVID situation where he just wasn't applying his mind properly, especially at the beginning. But so I think it does matter to a degree. But I think we also got to look at the vision. We've got to look at the values of that particular leader. And then we've got to look at the character of that particular leader. Because yeah. sometimes <clears throat> people value different things. Mugabe valued, you know, uh, having a one-party state. And that value was one which didn't prioritize, um, uh, what, what do we call it, uh, accountability and transparency. Uh, it, it prioritized his, and I think, should. narcissism yeah. almost. He, his value was him as the leader more than it was being in a system that creates uh, professional leadership throughout. So I think that's one. We've got to look at these leaders and their values. What are your values? What do you stand for? Number two, I think we also, number three rather, we got to look at managerial experience. And what do I mean by this? We've got to examine whether or not people can take something from concept <laughs> to product. Yeah. You know, because what you find with a lot of these leaders is that some of them had great vision and they say they had great values. But when you're not measuring, you know, the problem in Africa is that if an African leader promises you five shovels next year, you expect one in two years, right? That's the problem with African leaders. They promise you five shovels, you expect one in double the time. Even the NDP right now is not oh, going to be executed exactly. by 2030. But, but if a German leader promises you five shovels next year, you expect 10 next year. You expect over delivery in, 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 in the same time. You, even if you look at professional companies like Apple, sometimes they underreport their estimates and then they over deliver. If China promises you a hospital in 14 days, you expect the hospital in 14 days because you know that there's a managerial quality 
of execution that's there. And I think that's where we need to be looking at our African leaders. Beyond values, character, education, we've also got to look at, can you actually manage the people around you? But can you actually manage the projects you've been assigned to? So we've got to look and say, what projects have you run? Because I think what, what we see in a lot of these people is that they had paper experience but they had no project experience. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you look at Gaddafi and Sankara, when you're a military person, you the are discipline. actually running systems and people yeah. and projects and regiments. So you understand what it means to deliver. Whereas if you're just an economics professor somewhere, you don't necessarily want to, want to understand what it means to deliver, what it means to fight to win yeah. in a hostile environment, what it means to strategize against the enemy and win. And I think that's what this shows us. If, if I'm, if so then, okay. On a, on a last issue, just on what Jamie said, I mean, even when you look at the example of how many so-called academics in South Africa that wanted to go politics, I mean, you look at um, Dr. Rampela Mampel, yeah. it just mean he failed. Yeah. You look at not run an organization. organization. But also you, she, look, you, look, she, you look at people like Jonathan Janssen. Yeah. They want. They also had a stint in politics. Dismally failed. So, political. I mean, academic stature or intellectual understanding does not necessarily translate to. And also, being an academic in a in a university, you're not really like dealing with the administrative the nuts and bolts because you are like you can be an academic and rise through the ranks, but you're not the person like managing the day-to-day -day nuts and bolts of the university. So even though you come in at a high level of decision-making, you don't necessarily have experience in administration the same way that a logistics person would have. Yeah. And running a country sometimes does require that kind of logistics so expertise. So essentially, we need experience. I'll say this about Dr. Mampila Rampila. She did say there's a difference between an activist and a politician. And she has the scar. Ah, like come on, girl. Like don't, you know, girl, don't believe that. But she was nah, 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 I, I don't believe, believe that. that. Running. Don't believe that. She's trying to spin it. I don't buy that argument. Because her. here's the thing. In, 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 I don't know what relations was it. Um, Actually, my Rampera Rampera came to our taxi rank in Brooklyn. Yeah. Yeah. Actively on the street, campaigning. It didn't... There was, there was a disconnect. You could yeah. see, man, like people aren't... On campus, I'll no. tell you what we saw. They had an event, the launch event at this. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, and they came the day before to, to give students flyers. They didn't have enough flyers. They hadn't put up posters. And they came onto campus and were speaking to students at 3 p.m. 3 p.m. the day before the event. Yeah. And that's not going to work at this. But fine, they still had a good attendance. But already that was a sign that this was poorly managed. You didn't have enough time to let a campus know. <laughs> then the event was at 11 on a Thursday in the Origin Center at Vitz, which is a secluded uh, space. But why would you have an event during the day when students are in class, right? And then you're trying to, like, get a, a live student audience. Because, like she said, she's an activist. No, 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 but, but that, that is not even an activist. Yeah, no. It just... It's just like if you're thinking it's about mobilizing people. Who's, your, who's your target audience? Exactly. You're going into a campus, you want Lower to show that audience. you have a youth Lower connection. Audience. So she wasted that launch because she only got the hardcore politicians who were interested mm. in seeing yeah. this event. Mm -hmm. ANC guys, uh, you know, EFF guys, mm -hmm. whatever the case may be. And it was a hostile audience. She never got anybody else who was in class. Basically, she couldn't mobilize. Couldn't get the flyer. She couldn't, couldn't mobilize. That has nothing to do with activism they, or they. politics. She was in the only <laughs> Yeah. Not no, I mean, it's not an attack on her. It's just a reflection that these kind of educations are not necessarily going to lead to the outcomes Africans are So maybe for. everyone should go into the military before. <laughs> before. I mean, or Sankara and Gaddafi are an example to show that actually if you become... And if you want to throw soldier, in a controversial we, example, even China need, and Israel, where they do have and effective... Exactly, uh, Russia. There you go. Mm. So, so, so let's leave it. There, there needs to be some... Process training is what we're trying to say. Look, if you like the show, subscribe, like, comment, share. We're happy to share this content with you. We're happy to make it. Yeah. Uh, please practice social distancing. Wear your gloves. Wash your hands. You know, if you can't afford a mask, they're going for a crazy price. 50 rand is what I saw. What are the masks going for? And wow. it's a single use. But anyway, story for another day. We're t there's so much stress around COVID. We're trying to, like, give you some alternative content. Just managing this anxiety we're all afraid it's no, scary that's not true you're not, not scared everyone is afraid you, i mean everyone is everyone is eventually going to get it <laughs> no, okay. no, let's let's just leave you it. You are running out of time. Look, if Ma you Ma Ma Sega, you Ma 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 Sega. Mapasega's Ma 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 Ma
All right, all right. Mopaseka's comments will be the Mopaseka alone and not the views of this channel. I, I have a relative amount of uh, apprehension, but let's leave it there, guys. Wow, Till okay. the next one. Peace.